You see them every day, hurting people. They're all around you. That person on the street corner begging for money. The classmate struggling with depression. The overlooked. The broken. The lonely. The person who seems to have it all together, yet their hollow eyes say they're still missing something. It's the one thing that all people are searching for. The thing that finally fulfills us. And if you know Jesus, then you carry it with you everywhere you go. The hope that changes everything. It's what's really going to make a difference in this world. So many of us think there's too much brokenness for any of us to do something about. But what if there was a way? A way that each one of us could begin to shine our light into dark places, changing one community at a time. A way to learn how to share the hope we carry with everyone we meet. A way to learn how to see and meet needs that may seem simple to us, but end up changing someone's life. What if you could spend your breaks living alongside other students, learning how to live every day like it's a new opportunity to share the life-changing hope of Jesus with anyone you meet? And what if in the process you find your purpose, you find your calling, and this world that feels too big to change begins changing one life at a time through you? This is more than an experience. This is a new way of living. It's life on mission. My name is Amr. I'm from Jordan. I moved um, with my family to the uh, U.S. Me and my wife, uh, Victoria, was praying for the, um, the state and the cities that don't have Arabic church. After a long time praying, God said Cincinnati. We have a significant group of Arab-speaking people, so we've been praying for quite some time. God, would you give us someone that we can just kind of turn loose in that people group, right? And uh, Honor literally just called me out of the blue. There is not a lot of people know the culture, know their language, and can share the gospel with them. We came to reach our community, the whole Arab people, and now we have people from at least nine countries from the Arab world. God has brought Honor here. And we're going to support him, we're going to encourage him, we're going to walk with him, and we're going to see God get glory among their people in Cincinnati. I get the question of why move back to Puerto Rico. In the last 10 years, Puerto Rico has experienced financial crisis, political crisis, crises with hurricanes and earthquakes. And on top of all of that, you've got the COVID-19 pandemic. And so they're like, why would you go the opposite way? Everyone's trying to leave. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in Puerto Rico in terms of ministry. A lot of the folks that we minister to just live alone because families have moved onto the mainland and people tend to leave behind some of their most vulnerable family members. It takes their support system away from them. And so one, who I later met as Rosa, sent me a text that said, I live alone, I don't have any food left, please just help me. So I asked, can I call you? And realized that she lived near one of our local pastors. And so he and his wife came here and went to see Rosa and really ministered to her and invited her to church. She agreed. And, um, and listened intently to the message and, and then after the service accepted Christ. This is something that God is doing and I get to join Him in because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And in gratitude, we respond by serving others. And so that's the importance of giving because that enables us to continue to meet these needs and ensure that the gospel is proclaimed and preached and that churches are planted and that missionaries are sent. Puerto Ricans, they've been through a lot and yet we're gonna do what we need to do to overcome this and we're gonna overcome this together. I believe that every person needs to have an opportunity to hear about Jesus and it doesn't matter where they're at, what they are, whom they are. It's our responsibility to tell them about Jesus. He never shied away from anybody. Got something for you. Anybody over here can use a little snack? Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We'll get you one, we'll get you one. Got plenty for everybody. Ladies, can I, can, can I just pray for y'all? Oh, 
Okay. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you're doing today. Now, Lord, we ask you right now to do what only you can do, that every one of these children, well, they'll be uh, great men and women of God. If he doesn't have a relationship with you, that uh, you allow him to call upon your name. And so right now, by your power, we ask you to touch each one of these individuals' hearts right now so that they might have eternal salvation through you. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank bless you. you all. Bless you all. Be praying for you, okay? That you'll get through this time. But well, when I drive through the communities, when we see people who you can tell have a need and they're just looking for somebody, anybody, whoever, to help them, even if it's just in a word. How can you not be attracted to that? We had a really good life back in Brazil, a really comfortable life in Brazil. My wife, uh, she was a lawyer for the government, and uh, I was uh, a pastor in my, in my church. And then I visited a friend here in New England. He showed me around and he showed me people not knowing Jesus. We got over uh, 500,000 Brazilians living in all New England. And then I realized that God was calling us. We took the flight and we landed here in, uh, in Boston. 20 days after this, my wife delivered our daughter. I spoke uh, zero English at that time. It wasn't easy, our beginning here. I had to be strong for my wife and for my daughter. So I didn't give myself this opportunity to give up. And I remember that my first job was working at a Dunkin' Donuts. So I met a few Brazilians there and we started some small groups. And our focus was really specific to reach non-believers and to reach people who, who didn't know Jesus. So basically, my ministry is based on a friendship. And uh, the people who attend the church uh, are your friends. We started like gathering with people and we found a place. And uh, we started doing Sunday services. When people give, they are really helping uh, some families to thrive and to survive, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the journey. For me and for my family, it's been uh, uh, vital. What I'm learning is if, if God called you, He will provide. There's been a pandemic. There have been protests. Sometimes it's hard to even remember what the world was like before now. And yet the gospel is still good news. And heaven still rejoices over the number one. To make Jesus known, we each have to start with one lost person. Think about it. If I were to ask you who's your one, would you have an answer? I know it's hard. Your one might be someone hiding in plain sight. And sometimes, let me tell you about Jesus, just doesn't feel like the most natural way to have a conversation, but we're in this together. Tens of thousands of believers have found their one, and you can learn from them. Listen, everyone is talking about how the world has changed, but one person sharing Christ with one other person, that is real change. And it comes when you answer the question, who's your one?
with this week's announcement. So we've got a few things going on, but if you're new to us, we want to get to know a little bit about you. So after the service, come on out back, grab you a good cup of coffee, a cup of water, whatever works for you. It's hot, so water might be a better thing, but I prefer coffee. Uh, get to know 
what's going on here at the church, and we want to get to know a little bit about what's happening with you. Uh, speaking of what's going on here at the church, we got a few things going on this week. So, uh, kids, you guys have your Kids Planet and Snow Hut Day. We're going to go play around on the playground out in Greer. Um, so if you don't know where that is, it is out in Greer somewhere. Not sure exactly where, but that's what Google comes in handy for. Uh, so yes, come on out and join us from 10 to 12 there. Um, we'll take care of Snow Hut for you guys. Uh, make sure you're staying nice and cool and hydrated. Uh, but then if you want to join us for lunch afterwards, bring some money for that and come and hang out with us for some tasty lunch somewhere in the area. There's lots of good stuff out that way, so we'll find something. Uh, then youth. Also, you have youth that night from 6 to 9 o'clock for your Bible study and hangout time. So I enjoyed talking and re re um, talking about kind of stuff that happened at camp. Uh, some of the discussions. Good stuff. Good stuff last week. So we'll be kicking off the actual summer talks and discussions on Tuesday night. All right, on Wednesday night, Family Ministry is sponsoring a churchwide family barbecue and hangout back in the green space. So if you haven't checked it out or hung out with us back there, we want to invite you for some hot dogs uh, before or after choir, after prayer meeting. We'll be out there from 5 to 8 o'clock with games, hanging out, goofing off. So family and friends of all ages, come on out and join us and uh, kick back and just have a little bit of fun there on Wednesday night. I'm um, trying to think what else we got going on. Oh yeah, the third. We've got our God and Country service, and a meal will be provided after the second service. However, we do need to know if you are coming. I'm not sure what the meal is yet, but we're going to have some type of food. But we also need to know if you're coming, so that way we make sure we have enough food. Otherwise, Publix is over there. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's about it as far as what's going on. Hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the week. And by the way, if you haven't checked out our social medias, I've tried to upload and keep things up to date as much as possible there. I'm working on a few of those extra videos, but they're coming. Um, go check out our social medias and see what the youth, kids, and tweens have been up to this summer so far. All right, now you all have a great week, and we'll see you next week. And I wanted to give a report uh, from our sabbatical oversight committee. And I don't have a lot to report from the pastor. I have not contacted them yet. Uh, one of the uh, uh, plans that we made was just to uh, periodically check in. But I would remind you, this is our pastor's first Sunday away while he starts his sabbatical. So uh, we really need to be in prayer for him and the needs that he has. You know, I'm sure we were all heartbroken to see that uh, their dog had ran away. What a terrible thing to happen when we're uh, praying for some real peace and quiet and, uh, and a time for him for spiritual and physical uh, healing, the Lord to minister to him. But we should keep praying uh, that the dog is found. To my knowledge, it has not been found yet. So let's just keep praying about that and that God would comfort them. Uh, upcoming, uh, Colton Woodside is going to be preaching next week for God and Nation. And uh, that will be our first Sunday with uh, one service. And uh, so we'll be excited about that. And then following that, you'll see listed Larry Epps. And he is the chaplain at the Perry Prison. And uh, I've heard him speak a lot of good things about Larry Epps. And you want to make sure that you're here and you bring someone with you. Those are going to be good messages to look forward. But a reminder, pray for Pastor Wade and Elizabeth for this time period. Pray that, that we will have people filling the gap and doing what we need to do to help the church just progress right along while he's absent. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. As we enter the, the last series this, uh, today on the gospel and its international flavor, uh, the scriptures remind us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And because of that power, we all have our, our stories of how Christ intersected our lives in a special, unique way. If you can think back to whenever you came to Christ for the very first time, God used some unusual circumstances possibly or some people in unique ways. We all have our stories of how God has intersected our lives. And in Scripture, it also gives us kind of then who we are, our identity in Christ. And as we uh, move into worship, I want you to be remindful of this scripture passage from 1 Peter chapter 2, and it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, God's special possession. 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you stand your feet? Let's testify together of our faith in Christ and the gospel's power. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing by Above all things, act 
desire we express together. I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway to resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My song will be the same. Oh, Christ be desire that you would be magnified in all that we do and say and what we think. We lift you up. You're the reason why we've gathered. It's your celebration, your party, your truth that is life-giving for us, and your gospel that breathes life into us. Would you anoint your word as Ron speaks it to us today? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I was a little worried when I didn't see a lectern up here. I don't think I could stand and hold my manuscript to, and be able to preach what the Lord has laid on my heart. You know, I do things maybe a little unusual. I take the text and read it, and then I, I look for certain points in there that I think we should have, and then I go to those points and start filling in in between, and I end up with a manuscript that I always follow. And the reason I do that is because it's very easy to get off track, you know, and so I try to stick to what I feel the Lord has given me. I feel the privilege to be able to speak to you here today, and especially since I didn't bring a chair change of clothes, I asked Howie if it'd be all right, and he said, yes, it would. So uh, uh, I'm here not as uh, casual as, as most are today, but glad to be here this morning. Thankful for the opportunity, thankful for you, and grateful that we can share the Word of God. And as we listen to that song, may Christ be magnified in me. May Christ be magnified in you. And really, that is part of my message today, how he didn't know that. The same way it worked out in the, uh, in the first traditional service, the song that he sang was just excellent to lead me in. And so we're grateful the way God works in all things. And once again, may God be magnified in our lives. May he be magnified here this morning. You know, I recently read a story about a Minneapolis couple who decided for their 20th anniversary to go from the Twin Cities down to Florida to thaw out. Now this letter really caught my eye, or what I read, because uh, I know what it's like to thaw out. You know, I spent most of my life in Ohio, Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and then in, uh, in Iowa, just about an hour's drive south of Minneapolis. I know what it's like to be cold. Two winters there, and uh, we moved to South Carolina, and we've been thawing out ever since. 
And uh, last week we thawed out real good. And, uh, but we are so thankful to be here and out of cold weather. Uh, one thing my wife and I, we promised each other this. And some of you South Carolinas, Linians should take this to heart too. Don't complain about hot weather. <laughs> my wife and I said we will never complain about hot weather because we will not have to thaw out again. And uh, that certainly has been true. I know for you, some of you, it gets cold. And now that I've been here over 10 years, I tend to be acclimated a little more, and I get a little cold also. But nothing like living in the north. Trust me on that. So this Minneapolis couple, they made their plans to uh, return to a hotel where they had stayed 20 years ago for their uh, uh, and make this their anniversary there. They planned to stay in this hotel, but it was difficult for them to make their travel arrangements. They both had very busy work schedules. And so the way it ended up, the husband was flying down on Thursday morning and his wife to follow the next day on Friday. Well, when the husband checked into the hotel, the first thing he noticed was, and it wasn't there 20 years ago, a computer in his room. And so he thought, I'm going to email my wife and let her know that I arrived safely. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, there's a widow who had just returned from her husband's funeral. He was a Baptist minister, and he died of a heart attack. Well, back in Florida, as he finished his email, unfortunately, the two line up there, he missed a letter in her email address. So he sent it off, not knowing that. This lady that had just returned from her husband's funeral, the first thing she did when she walked in the house, she went to her laptop, which was open there, and she thought, I really want to look at, I probably received some really encouraging condolences from family and friends. So she went over and read the first letter and this was it. To my wife, I've just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine. And then at the bottom was a P.S., Sure is hot down here. <laughs> well, this morning I hope my message is the right message. And my message this morning is you, you can change the world. Let's read uh, our text today found in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 36. If you're using a pew by... Bible is page 1095. Acts 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. You know, when I first read this passage and our pastor left this text with me to go along with his fourth mission uh, series for worldwide missions, I read it, reread it, and read it, and I wish Pastor Wade would have been there. I'd have said, Pastor, what were you seeing that I'm not seeing for international missions? Well, I kept reading it, kept studying, kept praying, and finally the light went off. And sometimes it goes off light for me, but uh, or late. 
But it went off, and I thought I found the message that God would want me to deliver. And so again, you can make a difference in the world. You can change the world. And that's the thought I want you to have this morning, along with the chorus we sing. May Christ be magnified in me. Christ be magnified in me. When we're in Christ, we can make a difference. And we can change the world. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to speak this morning, to share your word. And Lord, this morning we humbly ask that your words would be heard. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would direct and guide and speak to our hearts today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first point I want to make and for you to see is their disagreement was not over doctrine. And now that's very important for us to see that. They had a disagreement, but it wasn't over doctrine. It wasn't over the gospel message. It wasn't over a truth. It wasn't over scripture. They just had a disagreement. And that disagreement was sharp. That's what the scripture says. And I think there may be a little bit more to this sharp disagreement than first meets the eye. Look again at verse 38. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. When Luke writes this, and he used that word deserted, he actually used the Greek word aspastanto. And we get our, our word apostasy from that. And evidently what Paul's feeling was with John Mark leaving the work, he actually apostatized, turned his back on the gospel message. Now, was Paul overcritical? Uh, we don't know for sure. The scripture never tells us. Was he being judgmental? We're not sure if he was correct in the way he felt or not. But as we look closer at everything, we may begin to get the answer. You know, for Paul, the fact that John Mark left was, was a whole lot more than just getting homesick and running home. Again, he felt that he deserted them during the time of their work of sharing the gospel. Now, because of this, Paul does not want him to go. And he made that very clear. I don't want John Mark to go on the missionary trip. And Barnabas disagreed with him. He wanted to take John Mark with them. So one of the questions I had to ask myself when I thought, well, why was Paul so harsh about this matter? And then I thought about Paul's character. Paul was never going to let anything interrupt his gospel message. Not even death. Over and over, he faced death. He did not let anything interrupt. And I, I think he had a strong feeling that maybe John Mark was going to hurt that ministry. And so he said he didn't want him to go. Barnabas, being a little more gracious, he felt John Mark was worthwhile and had a lot to offer. And he needed more tutelage. And he wanted to take him along. Think about John Mark. He was a, a young man maybe only a lad. We know he was young. His only life he knew was in Jerusalem. He'd never been outside the city. He'd never traveled. And now he goes with Paul and Barnabas to Pamphylia. That was a heavy uh, Roman and Greek culture. Very strange to him. And he saw great colosseums. He saw columns of worship of gods that he'd never heard of. And I'm sure that this frightened him. And also, it probably made him very homesick. So if we wanted to give a little bit of a benefit to John Mark, benefit of the doubt to John Mark, that he ran home because he was overwhelmed. He was frightened. He 
he missed Jerusalem. He probably missed his family. And so he left. And we know that Paul doesn't dislike Mark in any way, but just simply felt it wasn't for him to go on this trip. Now, here's the big question. Did this disagreement stop the gospel from going into the world? No, it did. As a matter of fact, now two mission teams go out for the mission work. You know, nothing can stop God's plan. God had a plan all along. He's sovereign. And when we wield our lives to him and want Christ to be magnified in us, his plan will work through us just as it did through Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and John Mark. Problems, many problems, can be spared by agreeing to disagree. I like to think, and I think there's some scripture to back it up we'll look for in a minute, that Paul and Barnabas, difference of opinion, but they agreed to disagree and accept God's will. Now I think that because of of what we read in in a later verse, and I, I like to think that that's the way they ended. And we'll look at that other verse in a minute, but I want to read 2 Corinthians 3, 5 first. Not that our competence in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now, I like to look up words in the dictionary. Uh, Miriam and I know each other very well, and so I'm in that dictionary a lot because... Uh, Some of these big words, I think, just need to be understood better. Competence is the ability to do something successfully and efficiently. So I think in Galatians we're reading, if you want to be successful, if you want to be efficient and work for the Lord, then it's going to come from the Lord, not from self. Some of you know my testimony, and many do not, but in 1979, I had decided to go into full-time ministry. Five years prior to that, the company I'd worked for had moved me to a new location with a promise of a future and a good career, which I was very excited about as a young man, and worked very diligently and hard at that job to be successful. During that time, we had built our dream home in this new location. We had joined a church. It was a newer church, fast-growing church, very exciting. People walking the aisles almost every Sunday. They didn't have a youth pastor, and as it began to grow, I was asked if I would consider uh, being a layperson youth pastor. And I agreed to that. And it was a great time. For about three years, we ministered to the youth. And along with the church, they began to grow too, more and more. And it was quite a blessing for me. But after a period of time, I would sit in a pew as our pastor would preach. And I'd think, Lord, I would like to be doing that. And over a period of time, I got to where the job didn't mean so much to me anymore. And I just wanted to be a preacher. And so we accepted that call in 1979 and told our pastor about it. Now, one thing had to happen. I I needed, number one, to go back to school to get pastoral and theological training, which I had not had yet, only college. And, And so... I wanted to enroll in that, uh, that winter semester, which would have been 1980. In order to do that, we realized we're going to have to sell this dream home <laughs> in order to support ourselves with the move and the pay tuition and everything. Well, I don't know if you recall interest rates in 1979, but I sure do. Uh, they went up to 10 in my period. They went higher. 10.2% and rising. 
the realtor that we contacted and wanted to use said, if I were you, we're too close to the holidays, the interest rates are going up and up, you'd be better to wait for a while. And we knew that we couldn't wait. We needed the sell of that home to be able to do what we felt God wanted us to do. So we put it up for sale. And I enrolled for the winter semester. Two weeks later, the house sold. You see, the interest rates didn't matter. The person who bought it had cash. That was good for me. That was good for the sale of the home. And so we ventured uh, down uh, to Tennessee where I took my training. Three years later, jumping ahead, 1983, I graduated in the spring and was anxious. Boy, Lord, where are you going to send me? Well, May turned into June. No word yet. June went to July. I hadn't heard anything. Several of my colleagues had already moved off to ministries. July went to August. Nothing yet. I'm beginning to wonder, Ron, did you make a big mistake? Did you really hear God call you? August went to September, and that first week of September, I received a call from a missionary who'd been working and planting seed all through Nova Scotia. And he asked if we could meet, and I said yes. So we met, and he told me about a group of people in the interior of Nova Scotia, very rural. If you haven't been there, uh, it's almost unbelievable. It's like a step back in time when we went there. Would you believe that there are no house numbers? Everybody just knows where everybody lives. If you ask for directions, they don't tell you uh, 112 on County Road 76. They say, oh, that's by uh, Joe's house down the road there. When we, uh, we took a vacation one day, and I don't want to get too far off track, but one of the young ladies of the church wanted to go with us. And our first stop was in Boston. She asked, what are all the numbers on all the buildings? <laughs> she didn't know about addresses. We always thought that was kind of comical. But here we are meeting with this 25 to 30 people. It really, it was just an extension of three families, basically, that Howe had relations. And uh, we uh, spent, I think, two weeks there. We spoke to them, met with them. And they asked me if I would consider coming to be their pastor. And I said, we would definitely pray about it. I believe I would like to. But we have one problem. Uh, they weren't ready to support a pastor. Now, they had taken over a vacant, uh, old, uh, deserted, uh, united Baptist church. There were no gospel preaching churches, I'd say, within 50 miles. And they had this old building that needed refurbished, and they were working on it. And the other thing was I had a family of three and thought about support. God answered that prayer. I had two of my uh, churches, the one that I left from, and the one prior to that that recommended the church that we left from. They both supported us full time that we could minister in Nova Scotia. So after visiting the consulate in Boston, going through all the red tape with the Canadian government, uh, they finally gave us permanent visas that we're, we could move up and we could preach in this church. So we packed up our belongings in a U-Haul and a station wagon and started the journey from Tennessee to Maine, across the border into New Brunswick, then you drive up to Moncton, New Brunswick, and then you drive around the Horn, and that's about a seven-hour drive to get down to where we wanted to go. Well, we got there. They had rented an old farmhouse for a parsonage for us to be in, and so we were there. You know, and the weeks went by, and God blessed everything. The missionary that planted the seed, the field was ripe for harvest. And people were coming forward, getting saved, joining the church. And it was, it was a tremendous time in my life. The spring after our first arrival, there were at least a dozen people who wanted to get baptized. Now, the old church didn't have a baptistry, so you can imagine where we had to go. 
we had to go to a pond. So we went to a pond and uh, let it be known throughout the community we we're going to hold service there and 12 people were going to be baptized. Well, that struck the curiosity of a lot of people and I didn't know there were that many people in Nova Scotia, but they all uh, came to our service that day. And when I think about, talk about the rural Nova Scotia, if you've never been there, there's only one city, and that's Halifax. And then there's a few towns around the coast, like Digby and Shelburne, and Liverpool and Bridgewater, towns. I didn't live in a town. Most people don't live in a town. They're just a, a village that has a general store and a gas station. And that's it. And if you're lucky, a volunteer fire department. And that's where we were at. But the Lord blessed, and we enjoyed it very much. The church grew. Financially, they were able to support a pastor who they later called, and God moved me on to another work. But I wanted to share that testimony with you that you would see how God works in his people. And number two, point number two, God's will is accomplished through his people, even sometimes regardless of his people. I think of Paul and Barnabas that we read. You know, that looked like a catastrophe. The dynamic duo, Paul and Barnabas, splitting. That's the, ruined of the, the beginning of ruining world missions. It was not true. God had something else in mind. Now two mission teams go out. So the lesson learned there is even in human inaptness, God still has the last word. Aren't you glad for that? Have I made mistakes in my Christian walk? Yeah, plenty. I'm glad God has the last word. May he be glorified, magnified in our lives. Now, even in spite of uh, man's proud tendencies, God's will is accomplished. Two mission teams going out. But you may ask, as I did, well, what about John Mark? You know, later we would read that even Paul commended him for his work later in the book of Acts. We also find out that John Mark had attached himself to Peter. He was part of Peter's missionary team. And the early church fathers say that John Mark was very good at writing down every act, every word that Peter spoke. John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark. Isn't that something? He wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He was a young man who ran away from the work. And yet look how God mightily used him to pin through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the gospel of Mark. We, we serve a sovereign God who works to accomplish his purposes and sometimes regardless of us. Point number three. Sin and failure do not ever have the last word if you belong to to Jesus Christ. You can make mistakes, you can sin. If you make that right, that's not the last word. It's not the end of the world for you. God is still going to work His will, His plan in your life. And I think we need to be reminded that. Reminded that when we fail, when we sin, God is waiting to forgive us and restore us and to put our feet on his path, his perfect will. God wants to do that. You know, I remember one time I was in a uh, contractor's office talking about a project. And as we were talking, I was standing by his desk, and I looked over to the far corner of his desk and kind of behind a stack of papers, I saw a little New Testament. And I thought in my mind as we were talking about the project, Lord, open the door for me to say something. And there came a point where I felt the opportunity. I said, so you're a Christian. And when I said that, his head dropped immediately. And what seemed like an eternity before he looked up at me in his eyes. 
He said, no. And I said, well, why not? He said, I'm not good enough. I've done too many bad things in my life. So I had the opportunity to share with him the good news that it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again so that you might have forgiveness of your sins and be received into his family and have eternal life in heaven. You may be here today wondering if God would ever use you for anything. He can. He has a plan for your life. You say, but I'm, uh, I'm not, or I'm too unimportant. I'm too small to make a difference. I'm not good enough. Too small to make a difference. Let me ask you, have you ever... Uh, Tried to go asleep with a mosquito in your bedroom? That little mosquito would keep you awake until you got rid of it, right? Something small. God takes small things and uses them effectively and efficiently when their motive is to magnify Him, magnify Christ. Now, we can certainly, each of us, use that encouragement that God can use us. No one's too small. No one's unworthy. If we come to the Lord and seek His will, magnify Him. Now, there's something else I want to see in our text. The fourth point. Satan will try to hurt the church from the inside. I think as I read about Paul and Barnabas, Satan wanted to take advantage of Paul's feelings. He wanted to cause division. He wanted to break up the dynamic duo. He wanted to hurt the church, just as he does today. You know, he will try to hurt the church from the inside. Paul warned the church in Romans 16, the Roman Christian church, in verse 17, he said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. This is Satan's tactic. If he can get divisions in the church and obstacles that people feel we can't overcome, then he's hurt the church. He's hurt the cause of Christ. And he will try to do that. And then there, as we come close to the conclusion, there's one final thing that I noticed that I want to share. There's something else in this text. Paul said a good thing when he said to Barnabas in verse 36, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Now think about that for a moment. What was Paul's motive in going back and see how they're doing? I don't believe for a moment Paul wanted to go back and say, uh, uh, Sister Susie, how's your garden doing? He didn't go back and say, uh, Brother Sam, how's work going? All those are nice things, but he was concerned about their spiritual well-being. He was concerned about their walk in Christ. Are you okay? Do I need to share with you anything from Scripture to make sure that you're maturing in Christ, that you're on the right path? That was Paul's desire. And I, when I thought of that, I thought, you know, when we meet each other, Sure, we ask, you have any tomatoes yet? Or how's it going? But shouldn't we be so concerned about our brothers and our sisters, the ones that we know well? How's your relationship with Christ? Is there anything I need to pray for for you? Are you okay? Is things going well with you in Christ like Paul did? Those are good words. 
Paul also said in Galatians 5.13, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Now, when that word freedom is meant, it means that we are now free from sin. We have been totally forgiven by our Savior. And we have this freedom. And he said, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I read from the New Living Translation. And the reason I did that was because in it, it said, satisfy your sinful nature. Now, in the King James, the NIV, and the ESV that I usually use, they all say flesh. And I wanted to point out that uh, the word flesh is fine, but a lot of people don't understand what the flesh is. But here, the interpretation of the Greek word sarx meant your old sinful nature, nature for the flesh. And I, I like that, and I think we understand it better that if we're going to do anything for Christ, we don't do it in our flesh, in our old sinful nature. May Christ be magnified in me, in all that we do. So as we near the conclusion of my message, uh, the thing that rings out to us, and we sung about it, love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that international missions will begin when we love our neighbors as ourselves. When we love our neighbors in the church as ourselves. That we're willing to look out for them, to help them, to encourage them, to build them up spiritually. Love our neighbors as ourselves. In the church, in the community, love our neighbors as ourselves. And then it goes beyond the community as we love and love our neighbors and begin to love those around. We begin to pray. We begin to seek God's will in missionaries and service and praying for our missionaries as they go out. We should pray that uh, out of our young people, God may raise up a missionary to go out into the world, to reach lost souls, to encourage believers. That should be our prayer. And then as we do that, we love our neighbor in the church. We love our neighbors in our neighborhood. We love our neighbors in our community. We love our neighbors in the surrounding areas. And then that love goes out to international missions. And they certainly need our prayers and our love as they go about the Lord's business. You can change the world. Did you hear it? I need to clarify that a little bit. You, in Christ, can change the world. I believe that with all my heart. God can take anyone who is devoted to them and seeks God's will and put his sovereign plan to practice and to use each and every one of us. You know, one thing that's really impressed me as we've gone through these the pastor started this series on missions. Even in the first week, I began to hear some people talking, talking about missions, what we could do more to help, uh, what we could do in our small groups, what we could do as mission teams to reach out, and service teams to help out. We could get more involved. People have suggested to me in ways that we could get involved. Also, there's been someone just recently talked to me about uh, people who need help in our church, love our neighbor as ourselves. Many people are, are going to see some pretty rough times with $5 gallon gas and recession hitting. 
and people may need some help. Are there people who could use a helping hand? I believe they are. There's so many things. If we determine in our hearts to love our neighbors and magnify Christ in me, that we can reach out to many. Our vision for missions starts inward, and then it goes outward. And I pray God will use our words, use this message, use his word to encourage us all to step up, and many have. Step up, especially while our pastor is on sabbatical, to fill the gap, to stand the line for him, looking forward to his return, and, and maybe people stepping up will actually relieve some burden when he comes back and not have to do so much. And that should be our prayer. That should be our mission in the church, to love our neighbors, to serve each other and serve others. And may God bless this time. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity, for these people who you brought to this place, for your word, Lord, that we've tried to present it in a way that it would be clear and fruitful. And God, now we just ask that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of each one. I pray, God, if there's anyone here or viewing that doesn't know you as Savior, they would bow their head right now and ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and come into their heart. I pray there may be an individual in our sounding that feels they're not useful, they're not good enough, I have nothing to offer. Lord, we know that's not true. We know that you want to use each and every one of us, that you have a plan for each step that we take when we trust in you. So Lord, work in our hearts. Help us, God, to love our neighbors. Help us to be a church known for our love for each other. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage. Hold on. Be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
This is his gospel, his message that he's given to us. And Paul reminds us the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week. presentation of Malden First Baptist Church, Malden, South Carolina.